Hey there students, Tom Ritchie here and welcome to our AP European History Live Review. Now those of you on YouTube, be sure to press the button to come into the Crowdcast chat. Now these are all going to be streamed on YouTube um, and they're all going to be available after the broadcast, but of course we love for you to join live and there are a lot of benefits from coming into Crowdcast. First of all, I'm going to be checking that chat a lot more. Um, also it gives you the ability to come in and ask questions and not only ask questions but upvote questions so i'm able to see who it is that you know what questions does the audience want so the people who are here in crowdcast are going to be able to actually uh you know have a lot of control over the specific topics that we're going to be reviewing because in about uh yeah pog in the chat right so with that you know, we're going to be here 45 minutes to an hour. We're not going to get everything in the Reformation. So those of you here in Crowdcast are going to have the ability to come in here and, you know, kind of dictate to the agenda, so to speak. Now, also, um, if you're in Crowdcast, you're going to be able to, uh, you know, you're going to be able to know when I'm going live. Now, my plan is every week besides my spring break week, um, I'm planning on going live uh, every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Now, thank y'all, uh, you know, for your patience. There were actually a couple of emails that went out today. Uh, the first one I accidentally put 9 p.m. Eastern when I'm going to be doing a push starting next week week okay so we're going to be doing review streams uh you know every week between now and the exam Mondays at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Now, as far as this goes, um, our, uh, <laughs> I tell you what, the chat, lots of pogs in the chat there. Um, and hey, uh, the stir, okay, excellent. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into the Reformation, ladies and gentlemen, and here we go. So going with that, will there be access to the playback? Yes, there will be access to the playback. Um, that's going to be available on, uh, you know, on Crowdcast. Now, I've got these streaming on YouTube as well and they'll stay on YouTube for a couple days, but I'm likely going to take things off of YouTube uh, at a certain point and they'll stay on Crowdcast. So with that, there will be access on um, Crowdcast. How to create a study plan for APEC? Um, are we talking about now, let's see, is the C near the H? For AP European history, okay, creating a study plan, okay, that is something that is really about, first of all, how much time are you willing to spend each week? Second of all, uh, making sure that you're creating a space that is that, that has no distractions. You know, I think you need to be spending some time with a prep book and that's it, okay? That you don't have a phone near you, anything like that. You've got a prep book, you've got a pen or a pencil and a piece of paper. I strongly recommend, I highly recommend Chris Freiler's AP Achiever. Chris Freiler has been doing AP Euro forever. I'm a big fan of Chris Freiler's AP Achiever prep book, which is available on Amazon. So those things, and then thinking about also, are you a reader or are you a listener? Like, you know, do you get stuff from reading? Does your brain adjusts best to stuff you've read as far as retaining it, or do you benefit from hearing lectures, okay? But the thing is, what I'm doing here is last week we looked at the Renaissance, which if you didn't get to that yet, go back and do that. This week I would focus on the Reformation. I think you also need to think about a topic, okay? So this week's topic um, for review is the Reformation, which somebody's asking here, can we talk about the Enlightenment? Sure, we can talk about the Enlightenment in a couple of weeks. Okay, Scientific Revolution, the Enlightenment will be two weeks from now, 8 p.m. Eastern. Are there only going to be five sessions? No, I've only just added five sessions. All right, Mr. Lloyd, shout out to Mr. Lloyd. And also, I'll be shouting out to new Instagram followers tonight. Okay, anybody that's giving me a follow on Instagram, which actually, oh, here's my phone. Okay, anybody that follows me at Tom Ritchie on Instagram this evening during the broadcast, I will be giving some shout Shout outs to new Instagram followers every once in a while. So go ahead and do that. And y'all can like my new post um, for International Women's Day. All right. So general tips for the AP exam. Uh, we'll be getting into that for right now. Uh, do what your teacher tells you, okay? Like on the essays, pre-writing, okay? One of the things that students resist more than anything is 
pre-writing. And I think that that is, uh, you know, that that's something that's very important. And I'll be doing some Saturday sessions. Keep in touch. Those of you who join me on Crowdcast, I am going to be getting to getting in touch with y'all about some premium Saturday sessions where we're going to go more into writing and all of that kind of stuff. Also, Marco Learning is offering student support, which that is another thing that you might want to be interested in. Um, but these streams will largely focus on content. Okay, so we've got Richard Oaks, uh, Beaster Class, uh, let's see, uh, Rasheem, um, Elena, and Isabel, Anna, Autumn, Noor. Uh, let's see, Noor, did you already follow me earlier? I think Noor's followed me twice today, but she wanted that shout. Oh, is that Pakistan? Okay, look at that. I'm actually going to Pakistan for spring break. Um, how about follow back for Pakistan there? All right, we've got, wow, we got a lot of folks here. Sydney P. Uh, Walters, Evelyn Costa, and uh, Lamantia Ella Schrader. Okay, thank y'all so much. And some of y'all going back and liking stuff. Uh, Evelyn, thank you so much. Um, for those recent likes. Okay. Um, possibly a psychopath. Oops. Okay. So with that, uh, we'll be going over exam tips and stuff like that later on. Okay. So with this, let's see what's, uh, you know, what's going on here. Now, finally, a content oriented question. Okay. And so Luther's lack of support for the peasants. Okay. Let's go ahead and kind of think about the German peasants revolt. Okay. So when we're getting into the German peasants revolt, um, what we want to understand here is that Luther got the blame for this. We want to understand that in the Holy Roman Empire, in the Northern part of the Holy Roman Empire, they were more likely to be Lutheran. Um, in the Southern part, more likely to be Catholic. Now, of course, that's the same as it is uh, today. And of course, during German unification, that was kind of a hang up, you know, while everybody um, in this German empire that Bismarck wanted to create spoke German, you did have the Protestant North versus the Catholic South and Bismarck's Kulterkampf, which was aimed at reducing the influence of Catholic, uh, you know, Catholic parties. And so as far as that goes, Luther talked about the priesthood of all believers. We want to understand that the Catholic Church has a hierarchical system, you know, as far as, um, you know, you've got the lay people and then you've got the priests who have authority over the lay people. The bishops have authority over the priests. Um, the Pope has authority over the bishops. Now, Luther believed in something called the priesthood of all believers. And so Luther says part of this priesthood of all believers is that anybody can go straight to God and ask for forgiveness for their their sins that a that the clergy in Lutheranism and in most Protestant communities don't have any kind of special power to forgive sins. So this priesthood of all believers comes with this idea that everybody is equal in the sight of God. And Luther is very adamant about this. Everybody's equal in the sight of God. And then there are these peasants that are like, you know what? If everybody's equal inside of God, why are we working for these nobles? And so there's this massive peasants revolt. And some of the people in the revolt, they are quoting Martin Luther. It's like, hey, Martin Luther said we're all equal. And so then, of course, Catholics are blaming Luther, you know, rather, you know, Catholic nobles rather than own up to, you know, we haven't been treating the peasants that well. They blame Martin Luther for this. Now, here's the thing that Martin Luther is one of the people who can get them to calm down. And we want to remember, we got 187 people in here. We're literally killing it right now. Okay. So with this, how do I explain Luther's lack of support? Well, remember, Luther is supported by Frederick of Saxony. OK, so Charles V was not a big fan of Martin Luther. And so Frederick of Saxony is Luther's protector. And as Luther's protector, you know, he is shielding Luther from the wrath of Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. And so as far as this goes, um, he is expecting, you know, Frederick of Saxony and other nobles who were enabling Luther, um, which Luther also, this is part of like the Lutheran idea. One of the things that comes up in the course and exam description is that the Catholic Church believes in basically papal supremacy over everything. Okay. The Pope is the end all be all. The Pope has authority over everything. If you are a monarch, uh, you know, the Pope has authority over you. There's no like separation of church and state. Yeah. Charles V, 
uh, then Charles II of Spain, um, the Habsburgs, they are the ones with that big Habsburg chin, Habsburg jaw. Okay, so as far as that goes, that the Pope says that you know, papal supremacy in all things, you know, there's no such thing as secular authority. Whereas Luther says that the church is only there for spiritual matters, whereas secular leaders need to be deferred to. Okay, so when Luther writes his pamphlet against the peasants, okay, Luther wants to make clear like, whoa, 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 that's not what I said. Uh, you know, I said everybody's equal in the sight of God. I didn't mean that everybody's equal here. And so Luther says, whoa, 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 whoa. And so as far as that goes, you know, he ends up writing this tract, you know, this pamphlet against the peasants, uh, a tract or a pamphlet or whatever you call it. And it was something like, you know, the final version is titled when it gets to the printer, like against the lying, thieving, no good, dirty, murderous peasants or something like that. Don't quote me on that. But it's a little more adventurous than that. And Luther, uh, you know, says that, look, I'm on the side of the nobility here. So this goes into Luther's idea of church state relationships relations, that religious leaders should defer to secular authorities when it comes to matters of the state and matters of politics. And this is something you can kind of think about that goes into Renaissance secularism. When you think about secularism in the Renaissance and this idea that there should be some kind of separation between, you know, there's some point where spiritual authority ends. Now, um, when you go into Calvinism, one curious thing about Calvinism, Calvinism may be way on the other side of pro, you know, the other side of Catholicism on the free will spectrum. But Calvinism does not recognize a difference between religious and secular authority. Uh, you know, the Calvinist, uh, you know, the Calvinist communities tended to be like basically, you know, church and state are like this. Calvin actually burned a heretic. Um, there was this guy like Michael Servetus who uh, denied the Holy Trinity, and John Calvin like burn that guy. Um, thank you, uh, Kenny Anderson and Maheen. Thank y'all so much for the recent follows and uh, SP Wavy 05 um, for the recent likes, even grabbing one of those Richie riffs over there. All right. So thank y'all so much. Uh, I'm going to be occasionally shouting out to new Instagram followers. Okay. So that's a little bit on Luther. Um, now, socialism, we'll talk about later. Um, the Thirty Years' War. Okay, yes, the Thirty Years' War is part of the Reformation. Let me get an easy question here uh, first, though. Jess of uh, Zwingli. Okay, so one thing I'm going to say is Ehrlich Zwingli never appears in the course and exam description. So one thing, even though, uh, you know, Ehrlich Zwingli is, uh, you know, in the court, you know, is, is, somebody that contributed to the Reformation, keep in mind that he is not in the course and exam description. Now, the Anabaptists do show up in the course and exam description. The Anabaptists who baptized again and believed uh, that, uh, you know, there should be a separation of church authority and state authority, okay? Uh, now, Zwingli, the only thing that I've ever really gone into with Zwingli in my class is that uh, Martin Luther, you know, now Lutherans will say they don't believe in this consubstantiation, okay, that it's a term that's kind of arbitrary, but basically the Catholic Church believes that when you take communion, it is the body and the blood of Christ. The Eucharist is the body and the blood of Christ. We're close to 200 viewers right now, so y'all go ahead and tell your friends to join us. Uh, if your friends aren't here, tell them to join us on Crowdcast. I get this Theo Vaughn thing every once in a while, okay, that's interesting. Um, Emily, I'm not streaming on my website right now, but I am streaming on Crowdcast. If you're watching in YouTube, uh, on YouTube, you can click there and go join us on Crowdcast where you'll get all the updates for everything. Um, so the Catholic Church is like, this is the body and the blood of Christ. Jesus says, this is my body. Luther says, it's not literally the body and the blood of Christ. Luther's like, spiritually sure but jesus you know is present in here spiritually like consubstantiation is like two substances basically that you, it's a physical substance that's not jesus and a spiritual substance that is now then you've got zwingli on the other side of this who says that was just a metaphor okay jesus is not present in this at all that it's just bread it's just wine or grape juice or grape drink or whatever you're using uh that that's all it is okay and 
there's nothing there. And so Luther and Zwingli, uh, you know, would not agree. Like basically at first the thought was, is there going to be one Protestant movement? And no, there's not. Because Luther and Zwingli cannot agree on what's going to happen with the Eucharist, okay, with the, the Lord's Supper. Um, is this the body and the blood of Christ? Literally, like the Catholic Church says, transubstantiation, uh, Luther's middle ground, or Zwingli's like, look, it's just symbolic. So with that, again, Zwingli never shows up in the course and exam description, okay? And remember, we're going to hit on socialism at another time, okay? So Anabaptism, I just went into another baptism. Okay. So Anabaptists, they baptized again. Okay. So that's another baptism. Now I've got a DBQ that I've done on the Reformation and I may be, you know, those of you who have signed up on Crowdcast, look for an email from me. I may be doing a premium Saturday session. Uh, there will be some premium sessions where I'm going to be focusing more on um, specific topics, uh, you know, like, you know, specific like DBQ related things. So Anabaptism, exactly. Okay. So as far as that goes, we've already gone into that. So the 30 years war, okay, this is something that's pretty important because this is kind of the end of the Reformation. Now, first of all, what we want to understand about the 30 years war is that it lasted 30 years. It ended in 1648. 1648 is a, uh, you know, that is a landmark year. That is one of the most important years that's basically seen as the end of the Reformation. Okay, 1648 is the end of the Protestant Reformation, this end to fighting over religion. Thank you, uh, Nanny Reference or Nani Reference. It's a written test uh, for those recent likes on Instagram. Uh, Natalie, and shout out to Miss Talavera. Uh, please, I tell you what, I'm a big fan of Miss Talavera anyway. So y'all let Miss Talavera know that I said hello and thank her for, uh, you know, plugging this stream to her students. OK, um, so with this 1618 to 1648, and it represents the end of the Protestant Reformation. Um, and it is the last war that's going to be the last continental war that is going to be specifically about religion. Now, I'm going to go ahead. I've got this lecture on my YouTube channel. So I'm not going to spend like a lot of time on it. I would definitely say here that y'all want to uh, watch this lecture again sometime before the AP Euro exam. Make sure to watch the ads. I always appreciate that. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen here so that we can take a look at the 30 years war. Okay. So going into the 30 years war, um, there's our friend Gustavus Adolphus. Now, again, it lasted exactly 30 years. So start with 1648, go backwards 30 years to 1618. And so where does it happen? It happens in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, now, one thing when we're thinking about historical context, I think it's always important um, when we're thinking about historical context, I usually think of historical context in a DBQ or an LEQ um, as setting the stage kind of, okay? So usually I like to pull my context from something a little bit before what I'm writing about. So if I'm writing an essay about the 30 years war, I'm going to pull my context from the decades before that. So one of the things that we're going to set up here, here, excuse me, in 1555, there was the Peace of Augsburg. Quius regio, aeus religio, or if you want to write in English, whoever reigns his religion. And so what's decided at the time, there were about 300 different principalities in the Holy Roman Empire. And so each of those individual rulers got to choose between Lutheranism and, and, Cal and you know, not Cal not Calvinism, er, Lutheranism and Catholicism, okay? Not Calvinism, okay? So each individual ruler could choose between Lutheranism and Catholicism, and they could expect their subjects to have to follow their religion. So wh whatever religion the local prince is, they had a right to impose their religion on other people, okay? And those of you who are doing uh, follows, uh, I will be doing some, uh, you know, some things with Marco Learning. Make sure y'all are giving a follow to my friends at Marco Learning. So make puns, not war with all of the underscores and all that. Make sure to follow at Marco Learning as well, okay? Because we're going to be doing some stuff together um, to help prepare y'all for these upcoming exams. So 
The thing about the Thirty Years' War is we want to note that it starts in the Holy Roman Empire, and it starts as a local and religious war, a local religious war, and it gets increasingly continental and political. This is really a turning point, um, you know, for warfare in European history. Um, so with that, uh, you know, and that may be a bonus uh, broadcast that I do sometimes. Now, the other thing is I'm thinking about doing some Zoom chats. So make sure, you know, if y'all are in the Crowdcast, y'all will get emails that I send out to the Crowdcast people when I'm doing little bonus things like this. Okay. So the Bohemian phase, now that comes from Bohemia, which which is the Czech Republic today, um, but there was a Catholic ruler with a Protestant majority. And the Protestants had gotten used to um, practicing their religion, okay? Basically, the Catholic Habsburg ruler had been like, you know what, in Bohemia, y'all just do whatever you want. Do whatever you want, okay? Uh, you know, it's kind of like if you are, you know, in like a fight with your girlfriend or something like that, and then she's finally like, do whatever you want. Fine. Do whatever you want. It's fine. Okay. And so basically, like, you know, what happens here is, you know, the Habsburg rulers had been like, do whatever you want. It's fine. Okay. And then all of a sudden, like, Ferdinand II comes in and revokes this letter of majesty. The Protestants had had this letter of majesty, and all of a sudden it's revoked, okay? And that's leading to uh, the defenestration of Prague. Who can forget that? That's basically when um, some of these Catholic messengers from the Holy Roman Emperor are just thrown out of a window. And so that's what starts the Thirty Years' War. Basically, the defenestration, you're throwing someone out of a window. Don't defenestrate anyone. It's not nice. Um, they dropped 70 feet and somehow miraculously lived, um, at least miraculously, according to the Catholics, right? The Protestants said that they fell into a pile of... Uh, mm. All right. So with that, uh, they better recognize. Now, <laughs> excuse me. All right, y'all don't have to worry about Corona. I'll tell you what, I got my like my third antibody test uh, that I got back that was negative. So, you know, I guess congratulations me. Like I've had through throughout the last year, I've had three antibody tests, all negative. So I'm pretty sure this is allergies, uh, which we're also online. So you don't have to worry about catching anything from me, right? And so with that, we want to note that in the Bohemian phase, the Danish phase, uh, the Catholics are pretty much up, okay? So local religious conflict in the Holy Roman Empire and the Catholics are doing great until the Swedish phase. Now, Sweden comes in led by Gustavus Adolphus, okay? So again, the Thirty Years' War is going to represent some serious changes in European military history. So when Gustavus Adolphus comes in, you know, going to catch me riding 30, try to catch me riding 30. All right. And so he is called sometimes the father of modern warfare because watch this. OK, before this, you had cannon, but Gustavus Adolphus realized, you know what? We can make artillery pieces that can move during a battle. Watch what he's going to do here. OK, so watch this mobile artillery. Watch it. Watch it. Bam! He moves the artillery. Imagine that. Gustavus Adolphus is like the first guy who says, like, look, like we can actually get the artillery and we can move them around during the battle. OK, so Gustavus Adolphus, the Lutheran Protestant who comes in from Sweden, um, he is doing great. Now, the French are actually getting behind him. I call this phase Swedish swords, French funds. OK, so the Swedes are coming in fighting. The French, whoa, wait, wait, what? The French are helping, what? Because I thought that France was a Catholic country. But if we go back to the French wars of religion, remember our friend, uh, you know, well, hopefully you remember our friend, Cardinal Richelieu. Um, he is thinking along the same lines of Henry the Fourth of France, the guy who did the Edict of Nantes, um, that Cardinal Richelieu was a politique. Politique means that you are someone who places politics over religion. So even though Cardinal Richelieu was a cardinal in the Catholic Church, um, he is thinking, you know what, when it comes to the balance of power, that France will benefit from the Habsburgs being less powerful. So this is where the dynamic starts to shift here in European warfare that now it's like, imagine 
not, uh, you know, I mean, imagine not going to war because of religion primarily, but based on what's best for your country. And that is this whole politique thing, which the balance of power, when you look at the Habsburgs and all of the land that they have, uh, then France says, you know, we're going to get on the side of the Protestants because they're fighting Habsburgs. And so Gustavus Adolphus ends up dying in battle. And so with that, uh, you know, but he's put some points on the board here. All right. And so the final phase, which is the largest and most destructive phase is the French phase. Okay. And now we're going to flip it over. Swedish stacks, French fists. All right. Because what's going to happen here is the Swedes are now going to be giving some funds. The French are going to be intervening directly militarily. So what we've seen here is a local and religious war turned into a continental and political war that is really no longer about religion. And so finally, by 1648, some things are becoming inconclusive. Like basically the fighting's still going on, but it's not like somebody like one side won a decisive victory. There's going to be no Treaty of Versailles, Article 231, uh, but no one really necessarily won the Thirty Years' War. But in 1648, the Peace of Westphalia. First of all, we want to note here, and again, the Peace of Westphalia, 1648, basically closes the book on the Reformation. No more continental wars are going to be fought about religion. They're going to be much more based on the balance of power and dynastic war. So Louis the 14th is not going to be fighting over Catholicism, uh, you know, like Philip the second had during the Reformation. Um, Louis the 14th is going to be fighting in order to, uh, you know, strengthen France. And so the Peace of Westphalia weakens the Holy Roman Emperor, basically takes away whatever control he had left over the princes, kind of setting up to what Voltaire calls the Holy Roman Empire, neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Okay. Do, 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 All right. Good one, Voltaire. And so with that, um, a few things that we want to note here. Okay. When we're looking at what were the consequences. Okay. So first of all, the Holy Roman Emperor was weakened. Um, definitely a, a step back for the Habsburgs. Um, the Dutch Netherlands become independent. Um, so this has been going on for like 80 years. You know, you want a 30 years war? How about an 80 years war? This has been going on since the time of Philip II. So the Dutch Netherlands uh, get their independence, uh, which is a majority Calvinist, uh, you know, kind of confederation there. So they get their independence. Um, Brandenburg will gain territory. Now, Brandenburg, Prussia. So one thing here that we want to note is the 30 years war is a turning point in European history uh, in the sense that we see the rise of Prussia Brandenburg or Brandenburg Prussia, you know what, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, Alsace goes to France. Now remember the Germans will get this back after the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, then um, the French are going to get that back after World War I. Switzerland becomes an independent confederation. And then the Holy Roman Empire is weakened, okay? So as far as the balance of power, one thing we want to note here is this is really going to set the stage for Louis XIV. Uh, so when we when we close the book at 1648, um, the next, uh, you know, we're going to be moving into the age of absolutism where we're going to see Louis XIV and this first period of like France, uh, you know, being this dominant power in Europe. And we're going to see a declining power with the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. So the 30 years war. Now, the other thing is that Calvinism is now accepted. So rulers in the Holy Roman Empire may adopt Calvinism, which includes the Hollenzollerns who are governing Prussia Brandenburg. Okay. Or Brandenburg, Prussia, I think. I like to call it Prussia Brandenburg. So I'm going to call it Prussia Brandenburg. It's my stream, right? Um, so with that, if you approve of that, make sure, uh, you know, follow at Tom Ritchie. Uh, remember, follow at Marco Learning on Instagram as well, because there's going to be some great stuff here. Um, thank you, Jamie and Haley, for your recent uh, for your recent follows there. And so with that, uh, you know, Calvinism and then the freedom of private worship. OK, that's another thing that we're seeing that we're going beyond the Reformation, where it's no longer going to be a matter of people coming into your house and, you know, investigating things. As long as you're keeping your religion to yourself, 
it really doesn't matter. So understand that the Thirty Years War, 1648, is closing the book on the Reformation. And so our wars will go from there um, into, the wars will go from there into more dynastic dynastic conflicts. Oh, thank y'all so much. Y'all have pressed F to pay respects. Uh, you know, press F to pay respects. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So, uh, so going with that. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's great to look at the chat sometime every once in a while. Right. Okay. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, yeah. So one thing to note is that those of you, let me go ahead and do a little poll here. Okay. Let's do a poll. I want to do a poll here. So we're going to do a poll. Thank y'all for, again, for pressing F to pay respects for Gustavus Adolphus. Okay. Um, do you believe, okay. So do you believe that you will be taking your exam um, on paper or on a computer. Okay. So we want to think about that now. It doesn't matter at home, uh, you know, or whatever, but paper or computer. Now, remember, they've got the first two weeks of May. Uh, we're going to see here, uh, the first two weeks of May is going to be the paper pencil administration. Then the end of May, the last half of May is going to be computer. Um, and then the first half of June is going to be computer. So as far as that goes, uh, the paper pencil is going to be the standard exam. The computerized exam will not have an LEQ. Instead, it will have additional SAQs. Okay, it looks like a lot of y'all, uh, you know, we've got uh, about 40% um, paper, pencil, about 60% uh, computer. Okay. So about 60, 40 is what we're looking at right now. Interesting. Interesting. So we'll, we'll see. Um, I am, you know, a lot of my own students have a preference um, for SAQ is short answer question. I like to call it specific answer question. Okay. So what are the, let's see. So as far as that goes now, when that comes up, Rebecca, I, you know, when you think about what are the most important things to know, you start to kind of draw a blank because you're only going to take the exam once. So any of that stuff could come up. Now, a few things, you want me to just rattle some stuff off the top of my head um, that first of all, I would say you should be familiar with Martin Luther. Okay. That's, that's a pretty, uh, pretty basic thing there. Um, then we want to think about uh, Luther, Calvin, Henry the eighth. Okay. Know who the Anabaptists are. If you were trying, you're trying to make a five, but if you're fine with a three or four Luther, Calvin, Henry the eighth, then we get to the Counter-Reformation, Ignatius of Loyola, okay, Francis Xavier, the Jesuits, uh, Teresa of Avila, it is International Women's Day, so let's not forget about Teresa, you know, St. Teresa of Avila, okay? So the Counter-Reformation and then the wars of religion, okay? The wars of religion, I would say, are important as well. Um, and so we see here Claire, Leah, Fancy Pineapple 64, Miriam and uh, Nicole or Nick. Uh, yeah. So uh, and then thank you, Leah Frost, for the recent likes. Uh, Y'all remember to follow my friends at Marco Learning as well. OK. And so as far as that, uh, you know, as far as that goes, uh, you know what we see, uh, what we see here. So. Uh, what are the most important things? Finally, the wars of religion, okay? The French wars of religion and the Thirty Years' War. So I would say, you know, Luther, Calvin, uh, you know, Henry VIII. Uh, know also the abuses that were going on in the Catholic Church as well. Um, and then the Thirty Years' War and the Counter-Reformation. And remember also the Baroque. I've got a lecture, on, I've got actually a two-part lecture on the Baroque, okay? And understand um, the relationship between Baroque art and architecture and the counter-reformation. All right. So as far as that goes, the as far as what I just said about the LEQ, the paper pencil exam will have an LEQ. The computerized exam will not have an LEQ. OK, looking like only about uh, a third of you in here are expecting um, to have, uh, you know, some to have things there. OK, so now also speaking of, let's see. Let me just run over here real quick and share a link. Uh, you know, my friends at Marco Learning are going to be offering uh, student support. Let me go ahead and just uh, throw in a quick plug for that. I'm going to put a link here in the Crowdcast um, and a link here on the YouTube stream. Um, so as far as that, Countess Teresa, T to pay respects to Countess Teresa on women's, women's uh 
International Women's Day. All right. So with that, um, take it on paper. If you take the AP test in person, no. Uh, now, the thing is, uh, now there are three options, okay? And this is problem. This is going to be determined by your school, okay? There's paper pencil, okay? There's paper pencil, which is going to be first two weeks of May. And then last two weeks of May, first two weeks of June, it's computer, but it's up to your school. Your school's going to determine if you're taking on computer at school or at home. So a lot of you who are taking it on computer, you are going to be taking it more than likely at school in a proctored setting. OK, so with that, uh, you know, let's go ahead and go to the next question. OK. Um, OK. So with this, again, we're going to do more like, you know, test taking strategy stuff, you know, either in my Saturday sessions that I'm going to be publicizing pretty soon and or Marco learning student support. Um, these are really these Monday sessions are really going to be more focused on content review. Um, now, with that is watching the video is going to be enough for studying. Um, that is something that uh, for some people, maybe so, but make sure you're watching some things that are going to help you write. So, you know, what's going to what's going to be enough studying? It's going to be really depends on who you are. So what was Jan Huss's deal? OK, now, Jan Huss is always somebody I like to note. Uh, you know, one thing to note here, let's uh, let's go ahead. Also, I've got this link here to MarcoLearning.com slash AP Euro uh, where we've got some study guides okay there is a study guide here jan huss i always like to mention jan huss uh when we are uh, when we're talking about let's see so i'm going to um get here luther in the printing press okay when i think about huss i think about like this is a guy about 100 years before martin luther just one second still a little <coughs> excuse me Oh, my goodness. OK, so with that, uh, let's go ahead and go into the printing press. So these, uh, you know, these study guides here at Marco Learning um, dot com, you can go ahead and look at those. Um, you know, I've helped create these. And so I always think about Martin Luther and the printing press. Jan Hus didn't have the printing press. Jan Hus was burned as a heretic about 100 years before Martin Luther um, for doing something similar to what Martin Luther did. But Jan Hus is great context for Martin Luther because Jan Hus didn't have the printing press and his ideas didn't get to spread as far as Luther's. And the church was able to basically like, OK, you know what, we're going to burn the sky before his ideas get too far out there. But what we want to understand about the printing press is that there is this now mass communication. OK, we've got mass communication, which is allowing people, you know, with the increase in literacy during the Renaissance, um, that Luther's ideas are getting out there uh, and getting out there in the vernacular language. OK, so the vernacular, remember, being the language of the people, the language that people speak, OK, the national languages. And so Luther is really like the first person. I mean, there were reformers that popped up here and there during the Middle Ages, but but Luther is really the first one to make use of the printing press. And so that's where, you know, when you're thinking about what was Jan Huss's deal, he didn't have the printing press. And so, you know, Luther is taking advantage of this loss of control over information. Now, we also want to note here, though, that while the printing press is resulting in a loss of control, uh, you know, control for information, uh, you know, the loss of control of information, what we're looking at here is to uh, that there is also a move to try to regain control because the printing press, you have the spread of Renaissance humanism, the spread of the Reformation, um, and then you've got uh, you know, the scientific revolution. Now, all the while, uh, you've seen definitely, if we want to look for a parallel, y'all have noticed how social media companies, uh, you know, if y'all noticed how the social media companies are now like working extra hard to make sure that if anybody expresses a viewpoint that's against what they want you to think, they put those little notifications there. And so, you know, they're like, oh, by the way, click on here. So the people that we want to tell you how to think can tell you how you should think about this. And so just like in this situation where we see that social media has made it so much easier to get your ideas out there, but then there's this pushback, okay, of between these, these companies that say, hey, 
we actually want to control the information, then, you know, you've got this index liborum prohibitorum, which is Latin for the index of prohibited books. So basically the Catholic church, the Catholic church is trying to maintain control over the spread of information. But we definitely want to know the printing press and its impact on what's going on, uh, you know, on what's going on there. All right. So with this, okay, and it looks like uh, Stephen may be making some uh, making some notes here. Is that what's going on? Um, all right. Oh, great. I tell you what, this is an impressive set of notes. Look at that anonymous chipmunk. All right. So uh, so with that, let's go ahead and get to some other uh, some other things. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I'm so glad that I can uh, that I can help you do well. All right. So what was John Huss's deal? What a question there. All right. So as far as that goes, now, one thing we want to note uh, that I think that, uh, you know, Luther, we want to note, too, that Luther criticized Catholic Church doctrines and Catholic Church practices. Now, if we were going to compare Luther and Erasmus, um, one thing that we want to be, uh, you know, that we want to think uh, in terms of is Erasmus and Luther were both critics of the Catholic Church, but Erasmus in the Northern Renaissance only criticized Catholic practices, not Catholic doctrines. Erasmus never criticized a single Catholic doctrine. And so Luther comes in and he's criticizing both doctrine and practice. So as far as that goes, when it came to church practices, um, he's getting into the sale of indulgences and not only the sale of indulgences, Luther then starts thinking about, you know, why is the Pope giving indulgences in the first place? Like Luther not only critiques the sale of indulgences, which is a corrupt practice, but he says the Pope really shouldn't have authority to forgive sins in the first place, priesthood of all believers. Now, when we get into the Counter-Reformation, one thing we need to note here is that the Council of Trent, okay, when we get into the Council of Trent, um, that Counter-Reformation Council, they say there's going to be no more sale of indulgences. But at the same time, they they affirm the Pope's authority to grant an indulgence, the Pope's authority to forgive sins as the Vicar of Christ. So with that, you know, when we're thinking about this, the theological concerns. OK, so first of all, the Pope's authority to forgive sins. Now, the other thing here and one of the biggest differences between Catholics and Protestants is and we can kind of put this back to the Renaissance. Protestants and Catholics both believe in the Bible, that the Bible is the most important source of Christian doctrine. Now, where Catholics and Protestants disagree is that Catholics say that the scriptures are the foundation of Christian doctrine, but they're not everything. The Catholic Church says, and they affirm this at the Council of Trent, the Counter-Reformation, uh, they affirm this in saying that, look, there are three sources of authority, scripture, church tradition and what's called the magisterium or the teaching authority of the Pope and the bishops. Meanwhile, Protestants say, all doctrines have to come from the Bible, sola scriptura. Now, another thing, another disagreement here is that Luther says that, or you know, the Catholic church says that basically Jesus saves you. OK, Jesus saves you. There is nobody that can go to heaven. According to Catholics, there's nobody that can go to heaven without, uh, you know, without the grace of God. OK, without the saving grace of Jesus Christ um, and by making a profession of faith. Now that you go from to Catholics and Catholics say, well, when you're baptized, you have free will. So a Christian should act like a Christian. OK, imagine that. I mean, Catholics say that if you're a Christian, you should act like it. Um, that your works are going to determine whether your faith was sincere. And Luther says, ah, I'm not about that. OK, so Luther says that the justification by faith alone. OK, so that no works, works do not have any bearing on your salvation or showing the sincerity of it, because Luther felt like the free will was still in bondage. So I would say for Luther, as far as doctrines, uh, you know, the authority of the Pope, um, the, uh, you know, sola scriptura, the belief that all Christian doctrine should come directly from scripture. And then we've got uh, justification by faith alone, sola fide, rather than the Catholic view of salvation, which is a cooperative process. 
uh, between the believer and Jesus Christ. Chris Freiler, AP Achiever, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome to buy any review book you want, but Chris Freiler, AP Achiever is the one that I recommend hands down, okay? You, you'll you pay a little bit more for it, but you get what you pay for. I, I'm just telling you, like out of all the ones that I've looked at, um, I will swear by Chris Freiler's AP Achiever. And I may be able to get Chris Freiler on one of these broadcasts at some point, okay? So hopefully we'll be able to do that. All right, can we get into the Habsburg Valaw Wars? No. Okay. Now this is a relief to be able to answer questions like this, because this is one of those things. I don't want to get into it and it's not essential. Okay. There is nothing about the Habsburg Valois Wars or Valois, Valois. Uh, it's a written test or a type test, however you're going to take it. Uh, so this is one of those things where I'm just going to say, nope, you don't need it. Okay. Um, so as far as that goes, uh, usually potential essay questions. Now I would think about some things, Rebecca, uh, like for example, I would think about doing like a comparison LEQ, comparing perhaps like the English Reformation with reformations on the continent, um, comparing Luther and Calvin or something like that. Um, also, we've seen the 30 years war as a popular topic. Now, I will say that they won't necessarily get into anything that are going to be, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, these are archived for the fifth time. We've probably got people at Tom Ritchie on Instagram. Also remember to follow my friends at Marco Learning because they're going to be helping in a variety of subjects. Okay, so I'm uh, always, uh, you know, always reaching out here. Okay, so uh, so with that, uh, you know, getting into uh, getting into this here. So with that, no shout outs right now. We can do some more shout outs. Sounds like most of y'all have already, uh, you know, have already done that, which is great. Um, so with that, I don't think that we're going to run into things that are being clearly theolog like purely theological. OK, that's probably not going to be the case on like an essay question because uh, there's got to be like equity because a lot of y'all were right. Like they're not going to ask questions that are going to give like essay questions that are going to give practicing Catholics like an edge over everybody else because they understand the doctrines from outside of class. OK. So as far as this goes, um, Stephen, when you're asking about, do we need to know the details for each of the phases in the 30 years war? Uh, this is one of those things that I would say, do you, are you trying to make a three or are you trying to make a five? Okay. There are a lot of questions that I'm going to answer relative to that. If you're trying to make a three, I wouldn't get so into it. If you're trying to make a five, then I tell you, learn everything you can, you know, get into the Habsburg Law Wars and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, so with that, uh, let me, uh, you know, let me just kind of go on from there. Um, so when you're thinking about how much you need to know, you need to think about your goals. OK, um, so with that, um, you know, movies and stuff like that, that sounds interesting, but not necessarily at the top of my list right now. Um, but with that, let's see. So we've got uh, when do you suggest Matthew? I'd suggest no matter when you're taking the exam, it's a great time to start studying. Um, but typically, I think that. That, you know, we go through here. So y'all, I think that we've got some things here. We are getting into, uh, you know, kind of, I think we've answered most of the questions here. So I'm going to go ahead and how important is learning the art? Um, the art, it's important to know, to understand the art movements in relation to the period. Okay. So when you're thinking about this, how did the Baroque, uh, you know, relate to the period? Okay, so let's think about this. One of my favorite Baroque artists, it's not so much just knowing a painter and their painting or something like that. Um, but if we're thinking about, uh, you know, Caravaggio, okay? Okay, C-A-R-A-V-A-G-G-I, okay. So if we look up Caravaggio, okay? Now notice here, we're gonna notice that a lot of this, he's got a basket of fruit, that has nothing to do with anything. Um, but we note here, there is St. Francis of Assisi in ecstasy. So we're gonna note here, not 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 what y'all are thinking, okay? Um, but he's not, I mean, he's on like, you know, basically, you know, he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's, you know, having a spiritual ecstasy, okay? So as far as that goes, 
uh, you know, that's what we're seeing here. But notice the religious theme here. Now, again, he's not painting a bunch of nudes. Like that's one thing we notice about Baroque art and how we can relate this to Catholicism, that this is much more, you notice that people actually have clothes on and stuff like that. There's Judith beheading Holofernes. Um, this is, uh, in actually, this is something that is in the Catholic version of the Bible. Like there are some like additional Old Testament books that are in the Catholic version of the Bible, but not in the version of the Bible that Protestants have. Okay, so this is something that would be, uh, you know, that would be familiar to Catholics, but not Protestants. Um, so we see a lot of things. Oh, okay. Um, there's St. Jerome. Now, another thing here, notice how St. Jerome is not ripped. Um, but this is a Catholic saint. So you notice how a lot of stuff's coming in, uh, coming in here. Now, um, you know, Bernini, uh, you know, Bernini was a sculptor, okay, of the, uh, of the Baroque. And so Bernini, the ecstasy of St. Teresa, okay? Now, not everything that they sculpted and painted uh, was, uh, you know, was here, but uh, not everything that they sculpted and painted is going to be religious. But this is basically, you know, pick one work of art and explain how it shows the goals of the Counter-Reformation. So when we're looking at the ecstasy of St. Teresa, we're seeing here, there is the angel, okay? And then here is St. Teresa. Now, this is promoting the monastic life, okay? St. Teresa was a woman um, who brought back monastic discipline. And of course, a lot of people are like, you know, I don't want to go in a convent because I want to get married and I want to, uh, you know, I want to have all of the benefits that come with getting married. And St. Teresa, it's like you look at St. Teresa, she's not missing out on anything, okay? When you're looking at uh, this here, that the ecstasy of St. Teresa, she is excited. And so this is showing like how exciting the church life can be. And when somebody fully commits their life to Christ, it can be a life of ecstasy and excitement. It's not a life of boring, okay? And so with that, you want to be thinking in those terms uh, that here, this is something that goes along with the goals of the Catholic Reformation or Counter-Reformation. Now, Catholic Reformation and Counter-Reformation are basically the same thing, okay? Um, that it's got a little bit of nuance, but it's the same thing, essentially. So going from that, where we're thinking Catholic Reformation, Counter-Reformation, when we say Counter-Reformation, we're tending to emphasize the function that is against the Reformation against the Protestants, counter-Reformation. But on the other side of that, we want to note the Catholic Reformation, that the Catholic Church is actually reforming itself as well and going after curbing some of these abuses, okay? So it's against the Protestants, counter-Reformation, but then it's also the Catholic Reformation, the internal reform of the Catholic Church. And it's just like when I talk about the Council of Trent. Um, I have a jingle to go along with that, uh, that affirmation of Catholic doctrine, okay, that the Council of Trent says, nope, we are not compromising with the Protestants at all. Affirmation of Catholic doctrine, okay, um, but then the reformation of church practice, okay, affirmation of Catholic doctrine, reformation of church practice, okay, and so with that, uh, you know, we're going to, uh, going to see some things here, okay, so how important is knowing the art, again, Find yourself just a couple of works of art from each of these art movements and think about how can I show how this goes along, okay? So when I'm writing about the Counter-Reformation, I'm showing how the ecstasy of St. Teresa, um, you know, is going along with the goals of the Counter-Reformation. I'm fitting the art within to the context of its time, okay? So with that, ladies and gentlemen, what's the Instagram username? And this is kind of a last call if you want to shout out here at Tom Ritchie. Um, and in the chat, if y'all are calling for shout outs to your teacher and stuff like that, uh, I'll go ahead and put those out there. We're about to wrap up this review session, but I'm going to be sending y'all some information 
um, on some other stuff that we've got, uh, you know, that we've got going, such as the Saturday sessions. Thank you, Joshua um, Bozarth and Sky Baxter for the follows. On the Saturday sessions, I'm going to be doing like more skill-based stuff, okay? But I'm going to be emailing those of you who have joined this uh, Corona class on Crowdcast. I'm able to send out emails to y'all and we're going to be talking about, okay, what are we going to be doing in these skill-based uh, Saturday sessions? Um, and remember to follow out to um, follow Marco Learning as well. Let's see, shout out to Mr. Borgeson and Miss, uh, you know, let's see, Miss uh, Sunseri, uh, Miss Maelstrom. Um, shout out to Miss Connor, Miss Bautista, at Miss Waller. Okay, uh, Mr. Day, it kills me, but I like the pain. Okay, that's uh, interesting there. Mr. Smith, Miss Tui. Um, let's see, Mr. Uh, Mr. Guido, Miss Irving. Um, shout out to, wait, Miss Farbs, was it? It was just like somebody was yelling. Shout out to Miss Farbs from Owasso OK High School, Oklahoma High School, not just an OK High School. I'm sure it's a great uh, high school. Mr. Uh, you know, Miss Whiteside, Mr. Frazier, uh, Miss Kelly, uh, Miss uh, Worelski, Miss, uh, you know, let's see, Mr. Kalandinsky, uh, Miss Fuhrer. OK, yeah, Miss Fuhrer. She's always been uh, been a big, uh, big supporter. Please tell her hello for me. Um, and so we've got uh, Miss Ree. Uh, Mr. Spiel, Coates, Mr. Donovan, uh, Miss Mills. Okay, thank y'all, thank y'all. And uh, let's see, Miss and Mrs. Anderson and Mr. Losey. All right, so Miss Al, you know, let Miss Alder. Okay, so we see here, Miss Stone, Miss Connor, Mrs. Connor. Very good here. And uh, let's see here. We've got XX Mon Key XX with an underscore in the middle. Um, Elise Queerdo, um, Tuvia, Rocky, um, XX Mon, Miriam, um, Oof, it's M, Shun22, Becky Montes. Uh, let's see. Thank y'all so much for uh, the support there. And we are going to be doing some great things getting ready for this exam. So, again, Content review sessions are going to be Monday evenings at 8. They will be um, archived, so you will be able to go back and watch these. These should be available. They should remain available until the exam. And then y'all are going to be hearing about some other things that I'm going to be doing, Saturday session Zooms. Um, also, remember to take a look at... Uh, you know, Marco learning uh, student support, which is also, you know, a good, I think a good opportunity um, for some of you, uh, you know, which the thing is, uh, my way of doing things has always been to do plenty of free streams throughout this whole thing, but we'll also have some premium content uh, that's going to be available as well. So ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all again for supporting this uh, session and Miss Roberts, Miss Minerva, Mr. Maynard. Um, and I'll also uh, at a certain point, uh, you know, we'll be, I'll be doing, you you know what? I may even be doing some Instagram lives and stuff like that. Yeah, let's go ahead and adjourn to Instagram live and I'll take a few questions, you know, even if they're not immediately relevant to AP Euro. So I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Thank y'all for those of y'all watching on YouTube. Again, make sure to go to the Crowdcast um, and thank y'all so much for, oh, Victoria's here. Uh, we need these live streams for A push. Victoria, I'm going to be doing this, uh, you know, I'm going to be doing this. Uh, later on, A push is going to start next week. So y'all can tell your friends A push will start next week. Um, I'm going to be doing those at nine o'clock. So y'all can let those folks know. So I'm going to go ahead and start an Instagram live right when I'm done here, maybe get my guitar out or something like that. So ladies and gentlemen, it is always a pleasure.